armed with trumpets, an ark, and faith, the tribes of Israel are said to have swept triumphant into the promised land. But did they? Sifting through Iron Age ruins for the tumbled walls of scripture, archaeologists find instead what some might call heresy. I'm John Rhys Davis. Join me as we search for the elusive tribes of Israel, next on Archaeology. The story of the Israelites' conquest of the Promised Land has long been an article of faith for Jews and Christians alike. The Bible tells us how, led by Joshua, they crossed the Jordan and tumbled the walls of Jericho with mighty trumpet blasts. In quick succession, the pagan cities of Canaan fell before their righteous assaults. And all the cities of all the kings of them did Joshua take and smote them with the edge of the sword and he utterly destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded. So goes the scriptural account. But today, a number of archaeologists challenge the historical accuracy of that biblical narrative. Their findings suggest that the Canaanite cities may have been destroyed decades before the first Israelite settlements, that they settled peacefully and gradually. And that heresy of heresies that the Israelites were themselves Canaanite peasants. Is it possible then that the Israelite conquest of the Promised Land simply never happened? When Jesus of Nazareth was spreading the gospel of the New Testament through the Holy Land, these ruins were already a thousand years old. This is the kingdom of Hatzor, all that remains of a mighty empire that two millennia before the birth of Christ reigned in the Middle East. To the ancient world, it was known as the land of Canaan. But to the Hebrews of the Old Testament, it was the promised land. Hatzor has lured archaeologist Amnon ben Tor in search of clues to an age-old question, rather a series of questions. Who were the Israelites? Where did they come from? Did Joshua lead an army across the Jordan River to conquer Canaan, as the Bible says? I don't know if there was a Joshua, but I hope to find, I look to find the period described in Joshua. 11th century, 12th century. Somewhere here, this is where they are. These bricks here, that's Canaanite. These stones here, this is Israelite, but of the time of the monarchy. What's missing in here, that's Joshua, or the time of Joshua. Ben Tor hopes that the answer may be found here, in the great Canaanite palace at Hatzor. Discover the past with exclusive ancient history documentaries and ad-free podcasts presented by world-renowned historians from History Hit. Watch them on your smart TV or on the go with your mobile device. Download the app now to explore everything from the wonders of Pompeii to the rebellion of Boudicca and the mysteries of prehistoric Scotland. Immerse yourself in the captivating stories of this remarkable era by signing up via the link in the description. This is Canaanite Hatzor, the head of all those kingdoms. There's no building like it anywhere in Hatzor and I don't think in the entire country. It's really big. So, and it lies all under where we are standing. This is Canaanite, look there. This is Ahab, or the 9th century. Over there, that's Solomon, 10th century. Over there, 8th century, the period of the kings, okay? So, Joshua, judges, kings, one on top of the other. The only one that is missing is in between. Israelites under Joshua, that's what we are looking for. Up there, those are the Golan Heights. Very controversial, no? Why? I thought we were talking about Joshua. 
But in Israel, the story of Joshua is never far from present-day controversy. The archaeology at Hatzor, within sight of those embattled heights, has political overtones in a country where historical claim to the land is a matter of war and peace. For it was here that Joshua and the Israelites finished their righteous conquest of the Holy Land, according to the Old Testament. They put to the sword all who were in it, utterly destroying them. There were none left that breathed, and he burned Hatzor with fire. This, look how dark it is, how black it is. Look at all those fallen mud brick. This is the real end of Hatzor. Look at the ashes, a half, well, almost a meter and a half of debris, of ashes, of wooden beams, of pottery, of all kinds of finds, and we are not yet down to the actual floor. So this is going to be a real big thing. Was it the Israelites who destroyed Hatzor, fulfilling their destiny as foretold in the Bible? Now, this is Hatzor, and this is the Bible. The question is, do they indeed correlate? Does it really mean that, as it is written in the Bible, this is how it happened? This is still an open question. We don't know. Because it says so in the Bible doesn't necessarily mean that it is wrong, OK? It may very well be so, but it is for us to prove. It may very well be that somebody else destroyed Hatzor, and in the book of Joshua, or whoever wrote the book of Joshua, attributed the story to the Israelites. For now, the answer remains hidden in the rubble of Hatzor. Unknown Ben Tor and his team are continuing their search for the missing chapter from the time of Joshua. Although their efforts are not always rewarded, today they have made a new find. So it's just like a little scarab. You see the head mm -hmm. here mm -hmm. and the wings and everything. Nice, okay. huh? Very nice. What year? OK. This is about uh, 8th century, something like this, 9th century. It's about 2,800 years old, maybe something like this. I don't know. We have to study it. Young. We have very young. Yesterday, we have to study it. It's the period of the kings of Israel. Okay. Yeah. This is Israelites. That's the Israelites, no question. But post Joshua, definitely. Unfortunately, not Joshua. So Moses commanded, so Joshua did. According to scripture, the conquest of Canaan was the last act in a drama that began with the triumphant exodus of the Israelites from Egypt. Moses led the 12 tribes of Israel into the wilderness. When they came upon Mount Sinai, Moses went up to the mountain to receive the Ten Commandments. Moses died before reaching the Promised Land. His servant, Joshua, would lead the Israelites across the Jordan River. At Jericho, the Lord commanded them to march around the city for six days. On the seventh, trumpets were sounded, the people shouted, and the walls came crashing down. For over a century, archaeologists have sought to verify the conquest as related in the book of Joshua. Today, a new generation of Israeli archaeologists is challenging the validity of the Old Testament as a historical document. Israel Finkelstein has surveyed hundreds of ancient settlements throughout Israel. He thinks the Battle of Jericho never happened. The conquest theory in Jericho uh, was really disproved uh, years ago. I think that uh, it's a process of maybe 30 or 50 years of excavations. Excavations in the sites which are mentioned in the Bible in the conquest narrative reveal that A, either the sites were not at all inhabited at that time or that the destruction of the Canaanite sites was a gradual and long process which took 150 years. Simply, this was not done by a group of people in one year or in, in several years or in short period of time. If Joshua's conquest of Canaan is a myth, then how did the Israelites reach the Promised Land? Over the past decade, Adam Zertal has also uncovered dozens of new sites. He believes they migrated peacefully into Canaan. We're looking now backward on Wadi Farah. I believe that along this road, the Israelites has entered from the Jordan that we can see on the opening 
and gradually entered and penetrated into the uh, uh, sedentary life, into the land of the promised land. Now, we know that the Israel, these Israelites were half nomads, and they moved, they moved gradually into sedentary, settled life. Zertal is convinced that the Israelites were originally nomads who came across the Jordan River and settled around Wadi Farah, the only perennial source of water in the region. Here they could live on the land and graze their flocks year round. Eventually, they gave up their traditional nomadic tents for more permanent structures, like these crude mud huts unique to Wadi Farah. I think in a very firm way that there were foreigners who came from the other side of the Jordan. They were not Canaanites since they were not directed from the Canaanite city-states to this land, but vice versa. Although Zertal has discarded the conquest theory in favor of his peaceful migration theory, he is equally passionate about a new discovery. We were digging here without understanding what it was. We didn't even dare to dream that we deal here with Joshua's altar. He believes he has found the altar built by Joshua at Mount Ebal after the Israelites reached the Promised Land. That was a moment I'll never forget until the, the last day of my life. Uh, there was, we couldn't sleep for a couple of nights because then it was a very good proof that we deal here with a real first Israelite altar where our people has started the real roots of everything, not only of the Jewish culture, but probably of the, all the Western civilization. I still can remember this uh, uh, enthusiasm and this excitement I think, never to be repeated in my lifetime. However, not everyone agrees with Zertal. Well, Mount Ebal may be a cult site, but the altar, as far as I'm concerned, is Zertal's sheer imagination. Israel Finkelstein has proposed yet another new theory for the origin of the Israelites. Convinced that they were not immigrants, Finkelstein argues that many were probably Canaanites, as were their fathers and their fathers before them. I think that uh, the Israelites were probably local people who um, were probably sedentary people in the, begin in, in the middle of the second millennium. Then there was a collapse of the urban culture, there was a process of nomadization, and after a few centuries, resedentarization. They were, in a way, they were Canaanites because they lived in Canaan of the second millennium BC. And for Amihai Mazar, Clues that the Israelites emerged from Canaan sometimes come from unsuspected sources. This little bronze bull was found by me in a kibbutz, a antiquities collection. It was found by a soldier training in the northern Samaria mountains, not far from Shechem, north of Shechem, biblical Shechem. It was found on a remote mountain, and I was shown the place exactly where it was found. We excavated there, and we could date it to this time, the 12th century BC, the period of the Israelite settlement. And we believe that the place where this bull was found was a high place. That means it was a sanctuary, an open air sanctuary, uh, utilized by those Israelites in the early phase of their settlement there. Now this is very interesting find because we know that the Canaanites, much earlier, also uh, used uh, or had in their sanctuaries uh, bronze bulls uh, made in a very similar fashion. So we can claim that this little bull uh, illustrates Canaanite traditions and inspiration on the early Israelite religion and cult. If the Israelites were Canaanites all along, when did they emerge as a unified people with a cultural identity? Uh, you cannot just ask who are the Israelites because you must also be specific about a time in history under Joshua or in the period described in the book of Joshua, did they know that they were Israelites? We don't know. We don't have enough historical evidence for this. But obviously, many people who joined in this new force were local or were from here. And the, it was a mixture of people, you see. Whether or not they identify themselves as Israelites, this mixture of people was somehow different. 
In the archaeological layers of Hatsor, the settlement after the Great Fire is quite distinct from its Canaanite predecessors. Uh, so we have something different. Is this something different, Israelite or not? For the time being, I think it is, but for the time being, we don't have an absolute proof. We need something else which I don't know if we shall ever find. Maybe we need a lot, a lot more of the same, but uh, I think these are the Israelites. And uh, it's a different page in a different story. The Old Testament contains a second version of the conquest that contradicts the book of Joshua. In the book of Judges, the Israelites dwelled side by side with the Canaanites until a crisis threatened to overwhelm them. The world was turned upside down. Around 1200 BC, a crisis burst throughout the ancient Near East. Many cities collapsed, the empires collapsed, the Hittite Empire, the Egyptian Empire. After 1150 BC, the Egyptian Empire did not survive anymore. And many of those Canaanite city-states, Canaanite cities, for example, the largest, the most well-known one is Hatsor in the Galilee, disappeared. They just ceased to exist. In fact, the world as they knew it ceased to exist. A golden age of trade and prosperity had linked Canaan to the empires of the Mediterranean and the Aegean. When they collapsed, the social, economic, and political fabric of the Canaanite city-states collapsed with them. Today, most archaeologists agree that against this backdrop of turmoil and unrest, small groups of shepherds and herders, now politically independent and economically self-reliant, wandered into the isolated hills of Canaan to begin the new life. Out of their experience slowly emerged a new culture and a new identity. In time, they would become known as the Israelites. Does this new theory, based on decades of archaeological research, mean the Bible is wrong? Does it diminish the legend that has sustained Israel for centuries? Perhaps it puts it in perspective. We have to understand that the Bible is not a source for describing the origin of Israel, for the simple reason that the biblical narrative was compiled at least, or even uh, written in Jerusalem in the seventh century BC. And in many ways, it um, uh, reflects the ideas, the ideology, the economic affairs, the political affairs of the people of Jerusalem in the seventh century, which means five centuries after the supposed events took place. It's a question of how you look on the Bible. There are many points of view uh, on the Bible. Of course, fundamentalists, both Christians and Orthodox Jews, believe in the Bible as the word of God and they accept its history as the true history. On the other hand, we have ultra-critical scholars, starting in the late 8th, 19th century and up to our own days, who claim that much of the biblical narrative is just a literary fiction. Archaeology is not here to prove or disprove the Bible. I mean, the Bible, as a book written in divine inspiration, needs no proof. Professor Avram Beran is a veteran archaeologist who began excavating in Israel before it became a state. He now teaches biblical archaeology at Hebrew Union College in Jerusalem. Take Jericho. Uh, how many articles and books have been written? Where there the, did the walls of Jericho came falling down? Now, I don't know if it really matters. There must have been some kind of a historical element in the story, but we don't know which of the layers of occupation of Jericho can be ascribed to it. We don't know when it took place exactly. But to me, the myth of Jericho, if you like, has sustained the Israelites and the Jewish people for thousands of years. But for Adam Zatal, each chapter and verse of the Old Testament is incontestably etched in these stones. The debate cannot be whether the Israelites were Israelite, because the Israelite entity here is quite clear by, as I said, the similarity with the Bible and the later Jewish temple in Jerusalem. In the Holy Land, biblical archaeology often reflects modern longings as much as ancient truths. How does archaeology, how does material culture relate to the biblical narratives? 
Uh, and here, this is a question of what's important. You cannot answer it in general. You have to say, for whom? There are some people who need, for one reason or another, to have 100% correlation between archaeology and the biblical narrative in order to prove or, or, or to give them confidence or to give them a sense of identity, to give them roots in history. For a dozen different reasons, people need to have 100% correlation. Others, I'd say, like me, I don't need 100% correlation. Uh, I don't need to uh, read a chapter in the Bible and then run to the field and see, can I find something which relates to this or not? My identity as an Israeli, I don't think it has anything to do with one theory or another in the book of Joshua. For some it is important, for others it's not. And in the larger perspective, archaeology perhaps serves the needs of a nation over time. When I was brought up uh, 30 years, years ago in the um, education system in Israel, I was brought up on the narrative of the conquest of Canaan and destroying the local people and so on. And I'm not sure that this is the uh, way that we have to look at things today. It's important for us, I think, in Israel, for the way that we shape our culture and our identity today, in the sense that it teaches us, I think, to uh, find a way to live with our neighbors. In the present-day turmoil of the Middle East, archaeology has shed new light on this ancient landscape. Far from shattering a myth, it has enriched an epic tale of struggle and survival that continues to rock the political landscape of Israel today. In an earlier time, the suggestion that the Israelites were themselves Canaanites would have earned its author a public stoning. Yet in the timeless interplay of science and religion, one era's heresy is often another's article of faith. Perhaps tomorrow, the idea of the Israelites as Canaanites will be no more earth-shaking than the theory of evolution. Well, here we have uh, maybe an unholy trinity, okay? There's archaeology, there is Bible, there is politics. Masada the site of an astonishing tale of heroism. A few hundred Jewish families holding off thousands of Roman soldiers, choosing in the end, death over enslavement. But in the modern dance of politics and archeology, span did the real story of this ancient battle get lost? Hello, I'm John Rhys Davis. Join me as we relive the siege of Masada, next on Archeology. span In the year 66 AD, at the beginning of the Jewish rebellion against Rome, a band of Jewish rebels called Zealots captured this mountain fortress by the Dead Sea. Here at Masada, 960 defenders, including women and children, held some 15,000 Roman soldiers at bay for almost two years. The Romans built a ramp up the side of the mountain and battered the walls of the fortress. According to the Jewish historian Josephus Flavius, who was in the employ of the Romans, the zealots made a desperate decision to kill themselves rather than be delivered into the hands of their enemies as slaves. When Roman soldiers poured through the broken walls of Masada, they were greeted only by the silence of death. In 1963, almost 2,000 years later, Israel undertook an ambitious excavation at the flat-top rock of Masada. What they found appeared to match Josephus Flavius' description in uncanny detail. Today, however, Masada is once again under siege. Some scholars question the story of the Zealots' last desperate hours, where they ask, are the bodies of the 900? 
Or is the tale of the mass suicide nothing more than the hackneyed literary device of an ancient historian? In fact, did it happen at all? Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I would like to welcome you to the Rock of Metzada, which is a very important page in the book of history which called Israel. If we are talking about heroism in this book, this is the spot and this is the page. I would like to go with you back uh, around 2100 years ago. King Herod took the road that we did today, and when he came to the foot of Metzada, he said to himself, I'm going to change this place into my winter resort. At what has become one of the most visited tourist sites in the world, guides tell the story of the zealots' last stand and their self-sacrifice as historical fact. And when the Romans arrived to the top, they found here food storages full with food, water cistern full with water, and 960 hero dead bodies laying around here left this world as free people, not as Roman slaves. Dani Bahat is not your average visitor at Masada. He is a veteran archaeologist who took part in the 1963 excavation. The place is so dear to me that I refrain from coming here. I'm today here for the first time after seven years. The idea is, you know, further from the eyes, the more further we go, it becomes more sublime. Perhaps at no other archaeological site in the world has the tension between the sublime and the real played itself out more dramatically than at Masada. Here, in an unprecedented fusion of myth and archaeology, the story of Masada took on a life of its own, a life that had to do more with modern-day Israel than the siege of 2,000 years ago. When the young state of Israel needed a symbol of national pride, the call to excavate Masada enticed hundreds of volunteers from around the world. What they found would not only excite archaeologists, but would create something of a national shrine for Israel. It became our national pilgrimage since we saw it in the last link which connects our, country, our people to our country. And we, of course, wanted to renew, re, re, renew that link. We went every year on a pilgrimage, all the youth movements, and everyone used to come to Masada. In October 1963, the stronghold was laid open down to the foundations, this time by the archaeologists. A giant mission of exploration supported by volunteers from 29 different countries, headed by Professor Yigal Yadin. Yadin, former head of the Israeli Defense Forces and the most celebrated archaeologist in Israel, orchestrated the enormous undertaking at Masada. He had a mission which had worldwide attention. Well, for a long time we have been the people of the book living in the land of the book. Then for 2,000 years, we have been the people of the book without the land. Now, for the first time after 2,000 years, we are again living in the land of the book. My aim is, I would say, to live again as the people of the book in the land of the book. They began their assault on the mountain in the scorching desert in 1963. The excavation became, next to the tomb of Tutankhamun, one of the most publicized digs of the 20th century. It was a very exciting time for young Israeli archaeologists like Gidoan Furster. And uh, one can remember the very great excitement we had coming into the field, starting our work on an unknown country. The hundreds, thousands of volunteers who took part in the unfolding of the history uh, of um, uh, Masada. Uh, we had, this was a site that uh, was actually some kind of a national uh, site. It was a national uh, uh, hope by everyone to be able to work on this site, which was very difficult to excavate because of its, uh, uh, it's so far away from any other center. Uh, we had, of course, a lot of uh, information, particularly from Josephus, and we were very eager to see if we were, uh, if our expectations were um, to be fulfilled. 
In contrast to the painstaking tedium of an ordinary dig, Masada yielded up important finds daily, sometimes hourly. Things turn up every day, every day. It's not that kind of site where you dig for weeks and weeks until you find something. It's loaded with finds. It was the greatest time of my life. Charred beams and blackened stones testified to a great conflagration. Biblical scrolls and a synagogue spoke of Jewish occupants. Catapult stones and Roman period arrowheads told of the intensity of the siege. But it was the human remains that spoke most poignantly to the archaeologists. Amnon Ben Tor remembers. And uh, I, I think one of the most exciting days of my life, not just professional life, but in general, was when I was working in the northern palace of Masada and uh, digging in the little bath of the northern palace. Under meters of ashes and collapsed debris, we uncovered uh, the remains of three uh, people, man, woman, and a youngster. The clothes, the sandals, the hair, the blood on the stairs, well, it was uh, not red, but brown or black. Here are the people who perished on the last night of Masal. And, and you can actually, you do actually touch them. And I, I don't think that there can be many moments in one's life that are more exciting than this. It was really exciting. Another two dozen bodies were found in a cave on the southern side of the mountain fortress. But it was Dani Bahat who would make an astounding find. A few yards from here away, that's the first which I found with my own hands, the 11 shards which bear names, amongst them one who was a commander of Masada, Ben Yair. The other names were on the shards were names which were kind of friendly names, like the fat man, the man from the valley, valley of Jezreel, the man with the round hair, rounded hair, the, the curly hair, Joab, the fisher, and these are the ones I can recall now, and Ben Jair, of course. If this is not exciting, I don't know what excitement means. But you suddenly feel that you have bridged those 2,000 years and you are making a continuity. And this is the appeal of Masada. But there was something profoundly unorthodox in the way archaeology was conducted in the heady days of those excavations. In 1965, Israel was a nation that felt surrounded, pressured from many sides. And the Masada story had obvious resonance. Neil Silberman, an archaeologist trained in Israel, is a long-time observer of the uneasy mix of politics and archaeology. The excavations of Masada must not be seen as a normal archaeological excavation or scientific experiment in which rival scientific hypotheses are being tested. It was instead, under the direction of Yadin, something of public performance art. A national pageant with an entire nation for an audience, with the entire world looking on. Though the excavations at Masada ended in 1965, the public life of the site escalated and perhaps even embellished the historical reality. The Israeli Defense Forces began taking their national oath atop the ancient mountain fortress, and a nation swore that Masada should never fall again. scholars today find the archaeological record is not in such perfect accord with the story of Josephus. Murmurs of doubt about the mass suicide at Masada circulated. Why were there 11 shards bearing personal names when the historian Josephus had reported 10? And why had only three skeletons been found in the northern palace when Josephus had reported that the mass suicide of all 960 had taken place there? While Josephus described that there were 960 zealots on the summit of Masada and took their own lives, Yadin found only a little more than two dozen. The fact that the bodies found in the cave on the southern side of the mountain, those given a military funeral in 1969, were, as Yadin himself publicly admitted, mixed with the bones of pigs, makes their identification with the zealots who were extremely particular about the observance of Jewish law, at least problematic. 
And what are the famous shards with the names of the defenders on them? The 11 inscribed potsherds that Yadin suggested might have been the very lots cast by the last 10 zealots before their suicide are also problematic in that hundreds, if not thousands, of inscribed potsherds were found over the sur surface of the mound. And in fact, inscribed potsherds seem to have been the method by which the zealots distributed food. According to the Roman historian Josephus, not all of the zealots died at the top of the rock of Masada. Five women and children hid in a water duct from the slaughter and lived to relate the horrifying final hours. They told Josephus of the magnificent speech given by the garrison commander, Eleazar ben Yair, after the Romans had broken through the fortress walls and defeat was imminent, convincing the rebels to choose death over capture. Scholars began to question the historical truth of Josephus. Besides a number of improbabilities in the story itself, such as how the women and children who were hiding in a water cistern could have repeated verbatim the, the, the text of Eliezer Ben Yair's suicide speech, I think that it's fairly clear by now that Josephus, like many classical authors, was giving a melodramatic ending to a great epic. The theme of suicide as a heroic ending for classical histories was common to people throughout the Greek and Roman worlds. In that, Josephus was really doing nothing new, but giving an accepted end to his literary tale. Their reinterpretation of the Masada story would touch off a controversy about the famous mass suicide and add to a growing consternation about the place of the Masada myth in a nation's self-definition. Colonel Mayer Payel is Israel's leading military historian. The, the, the pattern was more or less like this that the men killed their wives and children. Then they elected 10 people to kill the other ones, the other men there. And then the, the last 10 ones, you know, elected one of them to kill the other nine. And the only one who committed suicide was the last one. So it, it should not be considered as a suicide, but it, it was really, I won't say massacre, it was a slaughter. As far as what really happened at Masada, there's no question that there was a slaughter and a brutal, bloody defeat. But what probably happened in the last moments of Masada was more chaos than suicide. Certainly, some may have committed suicide. Others were killed, yet others taken into slavery. To assume that Josephus' story is literally correct, is to misunderstand what he was trying to say. And it's even more ironic that even for a time, an entire nation would take what was a melodramatic ending for a national ideal. The theory that the mass suicide of Masada was nothing more than a literary cliché has gotten a mixed reception among the original excavators of the site. It is a true story. It is a true story which we hear about from Josephus Flavius. We believe Josephus Flavius in everything he did. We discovered in Masada every possible physical proof to what Josephus Flavius says. There's no way we can prove one way or the other. So for those of us who want to believe the story verbatim that this is what happened, they committed suicide. For others, they were killed when the roof collapsed on their heads. Uh, one way or the other, these are the last defenders of Masada. And that's the big thing. It doesn't matter if the story of Josephus is 100% so. Some of us need it to be exactly so. I don't think it's really important. Well, uh, it's, well it, it is... It is not a myth, uh, because after all, I mean, uh, the thing happened. The question is, what was the significance for the history of this country, for the people of Israel? Every archaeologist is, in a sense, a myth maker, contributing by his discoveries to the creation of a shared national story of the past. This is where myth gets fused with politics. But Neil Silberman thinks that the world of archaeology is never immune to the power of political myth. 
For him, Masada is a cautionary tale. I think the danger of a huge project like Masada, so focused in, so, so, so entirely devoted in the public mind to a single historical incident, is that archaeologists can lose control of its political significance to politicians and other leaders who have very different agendas and different objectives to use the past. And for some, even the act of suicide is inappropriate as a symbol of national pride. And according to Jewish tradition, usually we would prefer life to death, even if you are doomed to be a slave. You, you fight if there is no choice. If you stand with your back to the wall, you fight until you fight for whatever it is you believe in, and if it, you need to die, you die. But this is not an ideal, to die for one's country. The ideal is to live for one's country. Cheryl Spivak came from California to find she had a different feeling about the story of Masada once she walked in these ruins. There's, in, to my mind, a prevailing sense of, of sadness here, of loss. Uh, people killing their children bothered me a great deal. Masada, in some ways, is a sign of failure, of giving up, of, of bowing to the inevitable uh, catastrophes that happen in life and giving in to them. I thought once that Masada should be developed as a myth in order to, you know, um, create bravery within our um, uh, forces. But now, following the Six Day War, I think that Masada is obsolete. Colonel Meyer Payel, in charge of training young army recruits at the time, has gone through something of a change of heart about the use of Masada for national purposes. Let's put it this way. Our educational and political authorities, maybe even military authorities, they use it for two different uh, um, sakes. The first one is to try to educate the army to be brave and fight till the death, etc. Basically, which I don't accept because I don't consider this a real, you know, symptom of bravery. And the other uh, intention is to demonstrate to the Jewish people in Israel the, I would say, the negative outcome of a disaster, of a total disaster, out of which we should learn what should we do in order to avoid another massacre? But uh, about 30, 20 years ago, we started the reassessment and we changed it. Now, basically, you won't find an Israeli uh, unit who would come there and swear and oath, or to take an oath there. At the time of the excavations, Masada provided a metaphor of heroic self-sacrifice for a modern nation under siege. But in a land where myth and history intermingle freely, many now question the wisdom of defining a national consciousness through a tale of zealotry and suicide. We should face Masada as it was, and I think that from the point of view of culture and morale, and humanistic and Jewish tradition, we should deny Masada.